I think I may be the only uh, transplanter here, professional. Tra yeah. uh, we're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we like you anyways. Well, thank you. Yeah. So obviously, you know, CML was the major, the major diagnosis for, for transplants in the pre-TKI era, era, and that has changed dramatically. But what I would say is, is I would encourage you know, physicians to make the referral to the transplant center with that first failure, you know, the first breakthrough in resistance. Not that you're going to go to the transplant, but I think it's the time to, uh, number one, look at donor options, uh, availability for the patient. Number two, to talk to that patient about the alternative uh, options that are available. Uh, and even, you know, and I said, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to need the transplant. Even with the T315i, um, uh, if you switch to panatinib and they're doing very well and they've gotten a, a, a good response, they may have a, a yeah. very good survival. Maybe, and, and another thing is a very important point uh, when they visit the transplanter to really increase the adherence because they now have how um, amazing <laughs> is the toxicity of the transplant. So I'm sure they are really right. encouraged to take the drug right. for the rest of their life. I think David was point. trying to make a different point. <laughs> Yes, yes. No, no, but it's very important. Okay. I, I won't, I won't I argue kidding. that. I was Clearly, uh, the risk, the, 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 you know, the elephant in the room, the risk of transplant is graft versus host yeah. disease. And yeah. we haven't yet gotten to the point where we can accurately predict which patient is destined yeah. to get severe GVH. And, we, and when, when, when that time comes, it'll make our no, lives no, the, much the easier. No, no, the joke I was making is that the, you want some patient to really take the drug. You just really bring them to the, to I, the, yes. to the allogenic stem cell transplant. I, I have, so I've had... I'm going to just say, I've had patients come to me in the clinic with just that, re they've requested, they say, why do I have to keep taking these, these drugs? Why don't I just go to transplant? I say, I have a patient I'd like you to meet. Yes. <laughs> you know, a patient who's yeah. gotten severe GVHD, so it can be sobering. Right, it is, it, it's an it's impo important part of education because, you know, uh, we also talk about our, the physicians, um, younger physicians who never manage patients in the era of, busulfan and interferon and the toxicities of those therapies. And the same applies obviously to our patients. They, they're not aware of the, the therapies that have been there and the toxicities associated with them, including transplants. So it is an important part of the um, ed education process. The, the, the other point I would make that a transplanter could help, help us with is that, you know, in, um, poor adherence to therapy is a, a key reason why patients lose responses or progress. If they aren't adhering to their ABLE TKI, mm -hmm. are they going to adhere, uh, adhere to tacrolimus, mycophenolate, steroids, all of the antibiotics, good, good and point. all the visits? Well, I, I mean, it's an important part of the education that we do. Right. I think that that you know, that, that I'm glad David brought up this issue because I, I think uh, you know I I, do, I I always remind the patients that transplant has not gone away. The order on how we choose therapies changes um, based on the data we have. Uh, but I also want, uh, want to remind me, because many times they say, well, I thought the transplant was a, 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 a treatment of last resort. And I want to remind them that if I leave it as a treatment of last resort, then transplant doesn't work. Mm -hmm. right. I want to bring it at the right time. Right. And, and I agree with you. Once a patient starts having re particular resistance, intolerance is a different business, but resistance to uh, one TKI and definitely two TKIs, it's time to at least talk to the transplant doctor, mm -hmm. at least see what options do we have for donors, et cetera. You may or may not decide to do it at that point, but at least let them understand what it means, see what, what uh, options you have for donor, and, and help you decide when is the right time for that particular patient to, to bring that uh, to, to actual practice. So. All right, um, Javier, in this topic about changing therapies, of course we have many uh, drugs available now, several approved, That's, it's a, it's a wealth of, uh, of uh, treatment options, but there are some uh, new ones uh, on the development. Can you just give us briefly a, di uh, a discussion of some of the, you know, what, what, what's coming uh, that, that you see interesting? Well, I always really greatly surprised uh, to see uh, how um, drug development uh, doesn't stop in even a disease where we have really, really great, great uh, choices, right? So I was very glad to really see the, the data that I already was aware of the, this new drug, uh, ABLE001 seems like uh, it's working uh, in a different uh, mechanism for the ones that we are used to. It's a non-ATP mimetic, so it's not really working in the, in the classical area where, where other TKIs are being working, with very, very exciting results. However, also um, interesting to really see that mutation may arise in another area of the kinase, or at least in this case in the, in the ATP binding pocket. So quite interesting. So maybe a drug that in the future it may be seen in combination is something that, that seems like a, will be uh, one of the future of these drugs, right? 
Um, just lastly, to, to really say that um, it's, um, you know, in Korea, this another drug is being developed that we may not really see in the United States, but seems like a, it's a kind of, a, you know, their own imatinib like uh, that has been developed with very, very interesting results, very, very comparable with imatinib. And, and otherwise... Uh, radotinib, uh, right? Radotinib, uh -huh. right. That's exactly correct. And, well, this is what I see, right? It's amazing that we still see uh, these new drugs. We keep discussing about combination therapies in, in TKIs just to completely eradicate or, or cure this condition. It's, it's kind of a controversial um, issue because we say that maybe we don't need that. However, I mean, there is an initiative to really combine in um, JAK2 inhibitor, uh, ruxolotinib, and many other drugs has been tested already. Um, interferon still has been having some, some uh, news in the past. The Germans has presented some other data. So we may see this, but I have to really admit that it's, it's going to be quite challenging because our patients are doing relatively very well, and to really right. get uh, enroll them in, in trials where they have other drug in top of the one, um, it's going to be a, a tough, tough um, future. Yeah. I think that the combinations, I, I see two areas where perhaps combinations uh, may have a role, although there are the challenges that you described. One is in the, in the, uh, in the advanced stages of the disease, particularly in the blast Absolutely. phase, where oh. we know TKIs work, but by themselves, very short remission duration. So we've combined them with, uh, with chemotherapy and hypomethylene agents and other things. I don't think we still quite have the best combination, but that's one area where combinations really uh, is, is actually what we do, even sometimes just uh, ad hoc. Uh, the other one is, is um, to pursue these sustained, durable remissions, because we talked about the treatment discontinuation, but the reality is that the percentage of patients that reach these sustained MR 4.5s, even with second generation TKIs, is at best 40, 50 percent. So there's still a significant number of patients who don't quite make it to those criteria for treatment discontinuation. And that's where there's the interest in can we do something else Absolutely. to push them to that level. Now, there are the challenges that you described that adding another drug right, and right, does right. that increase it, the, the toxicity, even if it's just for administration for a few years, so sure. not easy, but, yeah. uh, but an will, area yeah, of research. I, I just will add the, the, this group of patients who have been in, the, in this discontinuation trial in the last years who failed this continuation trial. Maybe it's, it's another area because in the past, every time that we used to combine drugs, mm -hmm. we never knew what was will be the outcome after this continuation that happened without any additional drug. And now we may really answer this question in patients who fail this discontinuation trial. Yeah. And one interesting approach that's happening there, and perhaps many of you are working on this and on some of these clinical trials, is with these checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab Absolutely. and, right. and Absolutely. the like, which is right. a very attractive. Very attractive uh, and has yeah. good data. But very and early. I, I think there's a signal, you know, about un trying to understand uh, how, why and when are people successful at discontinuation and in terms of NK cell, numbers, activity, sure. interferon certainly has immune That's modulatory uh, effects. And, and to me, frankly, if I can express my, my belief that, that the depth of response and talking about digital PCR and all, MR5, MR5, I don't think that's the key to me. It's what is the host immune response doing? And I, I think agree. that's going to be the it. success. And if we have a, a strategy to boost that immune response, whether it's the checkpoint inhibitors, interferon, whatever, uh, to me, that's the direction that to go, be. recognizing that you're adding toxicity potentially with the second drug. Absolutely. You sound like a transplanter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me